invite you to open a Bible to Acts chapter 22 as we continue looking at the life of the early church, the life of folks like the Apostle Paul, what we learn about Jesus and our own faith from their examples. And so as we open scriptures, we go to God in prayer for our own hearts and minds. Our first is that we pray for ourselves that the Holy Spirit would open our hearts and minds to receive the gospel of Jesus and his word for us today. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would speak to them the words that they need to hear to be comforted and encouraged in their faith and following of Jesus. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would speak faithfully and true the words of God proclaim the salvation of Jesus Christ for all who believe. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So as we are continuing going through the book of Acts, we're getting to the part, and thank you to Mary for reading the scripture this morning. I actually joked with her before, so I shortened it down for her, believe it or not, because we're looking at the life of Paul, which is basically the, the last third or fourth of the book of Acts is about the life of Paul and the end of his earthly ministry that we get to read about in the scriptures anyway. And so he's recounting his stories, he's going through all kinds of things. And so as I was thinking about the the life of Paul, it reminded me of a very um, important but hard to swallow lesson from seminary, right? So anybody ever had that where you, in, at some point in your life, a mentor or some, a friend, a family member, spoke a truth into your life that you needed to hear, but you didn't like it, right? And then you kinda, it ta- usually it takes a little while for you to appreciate that truth, right? <laughs> like if they tell it to you right away, you're like, I don't like this, and I kind of don't like you right now, right? But later on, maybe you mature a little bit, and the wisdom grows, and you go, oh, now I get what they were talking about. So as a seminary student in a Lutheran denomination, guess who every young, aspiring preacher loves? Paul, right? Because we're like, oh, man, he he talked about grace, and look at all of his letters and his great theology. Look at all the amazing things there. He was an awesome preacher. He he did all these things. Miracles happened. Every young guy is like, man, Paul is awesome. And so one of our professors was talking to us about that one day. And, you know, we didn't know he was messing with us <laughs> at the time. We're like, he's like, so how many of you guys, he's talking about Paul, and he's like, how many of you guys love that Paul did miracles? And we're like, oh, of course. You're like, yeah. And we're like, oh, great. And how many of you love his theology and his doctrine of grace and salvation in Jesus Christ? You're like, yeah, amen. This is amazing. Because we're done. We don't know he's setting us up. All right. <laughs> and he goes, how many of you love the successfulness of Paul's preaching ministry? Because if, if you've been following along in the scriptures, Guess what? Paul gave a lot of really good sermons and changed a lot of lives. And of course, all of us guys in this preaching class that are one day wanting to be good preachers are like, amen, professor. This is awesome. And he goes, now how many of you want Paul's life? All the hands went down, because we had all read the book. (laughs) And his point was, a lot of people, not just preachers, but I, I think it extends to all Christians, right? We, we want the ministry. We want the success of Paul and all the miracles and all the wonderful things we see, but we don't want the life of Paul because if you look at Paul's life, it's filled with a lot of difficulty and a lot of suffering. So one of the things our professor told us, he says, a lot of pastors want the ministry of Paul, they don't want the suffering of Paul. And I think it can be true for a lot of us. I mean, I I also admit, like, I look at the stuff Paul went through, and I'm glad that I don't have to go through a lot of the sufferings that he went through. And if you read 
Paul's letters to the Corinthians and the Philippians and other places, he'll talk about what he's been through and all the shipwrecks and all the persecution, right? We've read stories in the book of Acts where he is stoned for preaching the gospel of Jesus and left for dead. His friends abandoned him in his moment of need. It's like, if you just put that on a list and said, how many of you want this to be your future life? Or any of us signing up for it? Now, I know we're in church, and like the faithful good answer is, whatever it takes, pastor, I'm going to fault you, right? But if we just laid out all the stuff that Paul went through, how many of you, if you're setting a New Year's resolution or dreams for the future, like, I hope all that stuff is on my calendar and happens to me? And we don't. So the question to ask as we look at today's text is, how was Paul able to have such courage and faithfulness? Because that's, to me, despite all the miracles and all the wonderful things, the more I read about Paul and pray about it, the most amazing thing to me about Paul is his faithfulness and his courage. He just never quits. He just never gives up in following Jesus. And so how do we, following that example, how do we have courage like Paul. So a little context about our scripture reading this morning from Acts chapter 22. It really goes all the way back to Acts 20. All right, so we, we see it a little bit. Last week we talked in Acts 20. And Paul in Acts 20 says, I'm constrained by the Holy Spirit. He says, I don't know what the future holds. I just know that wherever I go, I'm, I've been facing a lot of persecution, a lot of threats. And there's a a way for him to play it safe, or there's a way for him to keep following Jesus. And in Acts 20, he says, but I'm compelled, I'm constrained by the Holy Spirit to go wherever he leads. And then in Acts 21, he gathers with some friends. And you know what all of his friends tell him to do? Don't go anywhere. In Acts 21, they all tell him, look, bad things are going to happen to you, and we love you, we care for you, so don't go to Jerusalem, don't go anywhere, we're just going to stay here. And in fact, in Acts 1, it says they spent all night trying to convince Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. And yet, Paul refuses to listen. So in Acts 21, verse 14, it says this, and since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Right? So in Paul's mind, his whole goal with his life is the will of Jesus, the the glory of God. And in fact, this is why he starts giving this speech, because he does go to Jerusalem, and at the end of Acts 21, there's a huge riot, and all kinds of people gather, an an angry mob gathers because they recognize him, and they don't like what he's doing in the name of Jesus, and so they start trying to grab him, and they start beating him, and they want to kill him, and the only thing that stops him is some Roman guards, Roman soldiers come in, and grab Paul and and yank him up some steps away from the crowd. Now, put yourself in Paul's shoes. I know it's hard to imagine an angry mob coming to tackle you and everything, but just pretend for now, right? If the soldiers let him go, he will die, right? This crowd will kill him. If the soldiers don't keep moving Paul and getting him away from the crowd, guess what will happen? Paul will die. And what happens at the end of Acts 21, as Paul is in this middle of, if I stay here, there's a very good chance this crowd will kill me. But if I leave with the guards, I will live. And Paul looks at the guards and goes, wait a second. Can I talk to the crowd? Now, if you're there and you're Paul, how many of you are like, hey, this, this group of people hates me so much that they want to kill me, are going to turn around and go, I'd like to give a sermon right now? Anybody? Most of you don't want to do a sermon right now. <laughs> but especially if an angry crowd was coming at you, like, they're not feeling it, right? You're like, and so he tells the guard at the end of Acts 21, let, let me talk to them. That takes an incredible amount of bravery and courage. And his speech, so in Acts chapter 22, starting at verse 3, is going to reveal to us, how does Paul have so much 
courage and faithfulness in the midst of difficulties and hardships, in the midst of when he, like he says in Acts 20, I don't know what's going to happen next. So he says in verse 3, he's giving his story, he's giving his testimony, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way, in the book of Acts, the way is the name for the church. He's saying, I persecuted the church, I persecuted the Christians to death binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds and chains to Jerusalem to be punished. So what he's telling the crowd is, I once was just like you. Right? And he's bragging about his career, he's bragging about his resume, and he's telling them, look how amazing and well thought of and successful I was. Later on in Corinthians, he will brag about it again. Later on in Philippians, he will brag about his resume and get the very famous line, I counted it all rubbish compared to Jesus Christ. Right? And so what Paul is doing, he's saying, look, here is what I built my life on. I built it on everything that my culture, my society says will make you successful and influential and powerful. In Paul's world, he had it all. The Pharisees were incredibly well thought of and respected and revered. To say he was a student of Gamaliel was to say I was in the most successful types of business schools you could possibly imagine. And then he says, but I had this authority, I had this power to go from place to place from the high priests themselves. So he had power and influence and authority. He's saying, that I had all of this. Now, in our minds, if you have all the successes of the world, you have what? Like nothing to worry about, nothing to be afraid of. In, in Paul's world, in those first few verses, when he was living that life, he had nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. He had everything you could imagine in life. He had nothing lacking. And then he says, something happened. He, in verse six, he says, as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why? Are you persecuting me? And of course, this is the story of Saul's conversion where Jesus knocks him down and humbles him and begins to question him. And then Paul realizes that he has been fighting against Jesus. He's been fighting against God despite all of his success, all of his achievements in life. So the first lesson that we learn from Paul, how do you actually have courage in your life? is to think less of yourself. To, to not put your whole focus on your own self, but to put your focus in your life on Jesus. Because in the first half of the story, what is Paul doing? He's bragging about all the things he did, right? All the achievements that he has made, all the things that he's done that has made him successful in life, and he's saying, I had everything. There was nothing that in this world that I didn't have or couldn't get. And then Jesus comes along, and Paul's life is totally changed. He becomes, he goes from Saul to the Paul that we know, this miraculous missionary with all kinds of bravery and faithfulness and courage. And, and the shift is he goes from thinking about himself, centering his life on himself, and centering his life on Jesus. Right? As we talk about humility, C.S. Lewis often describes humility in this way. It's not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less, right? And the idea is not just putting your, not insulting yourself, degrading yourself all the time. That's not humility. Humility is I'm not making my life about me. I'm making it about the betterment of others. I'm making it about following Jesus. And so what happens to Paul as Jesus comes to him in this miraculous way is his whole life changes, and so in verse 12, after Paul's conversion, it says, one Ananias, a devout man according to law, 
well spoken by, of, by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So Paul becomes the Paul we all love and adore and look up to, want to follow the example, not because of anything Paul did. All the stuff that Paul did in his life that he bragged about, would boast about, was in those first few verses. And then the thing that made him the, the missionary and the, the apostle and the disciple that we all know and adore and are so thankful for is that Jesus forgave his sins and changed his life. And so from that point on, Paul's whole focus of his life no longer becomes his resume. It no longer becomes his achievements. It no longer becomes all the things that he could succeed at or how people think of him. Instead, his whole life becomes about how can I make much of Jesus Christ? And so, of course, he becomes brave. Of course, he becomes courageous. Why? Feels like he's got nothing to lose, right? He's like, well, they're not going to let me be a Pharisee anymore. <laughs> That's his job. That's his career. He says, oh, well. Right? They're not going to respect me anymore. They're not going to think highly of me anymore. And Paul's reaction becomes, I'm okay with that. My priority in life is not what people think of me, but what God thinks of me. Right? So the, the foundational truth of how does Paul become such a courageous person of faith is Jesus. He makes his whole life about Jesus. He makes his whole value, his whole identity about Jesus has redeemed me, he has saved me, he has forgiven me. And this is why in Philippians he says, I count everything else as rubbish, a garbage heap, a dumpster, compared to what I have in Christ. So I think we, we, we mix it up in our heads. We think, well, if I want to be like Paul, most of us, first of all, how many of you, how many of you, just be honest, <laughs> have gone, Never mind, I'm not going to be like Paul. Just giving up, like, before you even started trying. You're just like, this is not, not happening. All right. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Like, he, he, he did a lot of good stuff. But you can be like Paul when you follow his example of saying, no, my life belongs to Jesus. My life is about Jesus, what he has done for me. So the other stuff, yeah, it's part of our lives, but it's not the foundation of our identity. It's not everything we are. It's not what we exist for. And so Paul humbles himself. He's, he's lowered by Christ. Christ tells him, Paul, you've been living this one way. You've been striving for all these things, and I'm letting you know it's the wrong way to live. And so he knocks him off his horse. He humbles him. He says, this is what I want you to do. And so in verse 17, when I had returned to Jerusalem, Paul says, I was praying in the temple, and I fell into a trance, and he's talking to God, and God speaks to him and warns him to leave Jerusalem at the time. And then Paul says, well, they shouldn't mistreat me because they know all the stuff I did. <laughs> right? and he said, they, they know how I persecuted the church. They know how I imprisoned and killed people. So how, how is this going to work if I can't minister to them? And then Jesus changes Paul's life. In verse 21, he says, Jesus said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So God changes the direction of Paul's life. Paul's whole ministry that you get to read about in Acts and all of his letters, all the stuff that he did, is decided and directed by Jesus. Now, why does this matter for you and me? So say you're a Christian, right? right? You believe in Jesus. That means by God's grace, you have eternal life and salvation. Amen? Right? And here's what we do as Christians. We go, oh, I belong to Jesus, so that means I get eternal life. And if he comes back before I die, I get to be with him forever. If I die before he comes back, I get to go to heaven and be with him forever. Amen? And that's our whole comfort. We're like, yes, that's what we get in Jesus. 
And so we go, okay, Jesus is in charge of that part. He oversees that area of my life. But I'm in charge of the rest. I'm not going to ask you to show hands, all right? But let's be honest. A lot of us live this way where Jesus is in control of the eternal life aspect, right? Because it's like the only way you're getting it. So you're like, yes, he's in charge here. I get eternal life with him. The rest of my life, my job, my career, my relationships, where I live, what I do, where I go, that is up to who? Now, I know we're in church, and the right answer is to say God, right? But just hypothetically speaking, let's assume you're a sinner. The real answer is it's up to me, right? Because we usually, when we make decisions, we might pray about it, talk to some friends about it. But a lot of times we go, well, I thought about it. So I thought about it. And I've decided what? I'm going to do this. The first few verses of this passage where Paul is bragging about his before Jesus resume is is Paul living a life where he goes, I've decided to do this. I've decided to do that. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to be about this. I'm going to make my whole life about this. And at the very end of the story, as Paul is sharing his story to this crowd about how Jesus has changed him, he ends with this. God, Jesus said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So who decided the direction of Paul's life, the part that we all love and admire? Was it Paul or God? It's God, right? So this is the other part of how does Paul have such courage and how you and I can have the same courage? Because you and I have the same God. You and I have the same Jesus. We have the same Holy Spirit in our lives that Paul did. And the difference is, in the first half, Paul was like, this is my life. I'm doing these things. I'm going for these things. I'm striving after this. I'm going to make my life ultimately all about me. Now, if you live your life that way, you can very well, like Paul, have awesome worldly success. Have people look at you and admire you. You know, people respect you. People go, I want to be like them. Have people think of you highly and regard you. And you can be wildly successful. But you will also be wildly fragile and insecure. Because if you make your whole life all about you like Paul did in the first half, guess what you're not going to have? Courage. Because you're going to always be afraid of what? If I make the wrong step, if I make the wrong choice, What will they say about me? What will they think of me? How will they respond to what I'm doing? And you won't live with courage anymore. You'll just live in fear because you're always gonna be living by everybody else's standards, everybody else's viewpoints, everything else that they say. You know when we're kids, we talk about peer pressure. Anybody heard of peer pressure? Anybody ever had those talks in school, like, don't give in to peer pressure, and then you always get the ridiculous hypothetical, if everybody else was jumping off the bridge, would you jump too? And I used to tell my mom, because I'm sarcastic and it's not healthy, how high is the bridge? And I learned moms don't like that answer. (laughs) How high is the bridge? Anybody heard that? Though, when you're growing up from your parents or in school, right? Like, well, if everybody else is doing it, would you? And what are you trying to tell people? You're trying to teach kids not to do what? Give in to peer pressure, give in to the crowd. You know what adults are really bad at doing? Obeying that rule. <laughs> we give in to peer pressure, we give in to the crowd all the time. And that is what living for yourself will lead you to. You won't be brave and courageous. You, you will live in fear of what does everybody else think? What does everybody else say? You'll be living in fear of losing. And Paul had that kind of life. And then he met Jesus. He made his whole identity about Jesus has forgiven my sins. He has redeemed me. I belong to him now. And he didn't just make his eternal life about Jesus. right? Paul made his earthly life about Jesus as well. 
which is why he ends the story at verse 21. God said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. If you are Paul and you've lived your whole life as this zealous anti-Christian Pharisee, the last people you wanna go to is the unclean pagan Gentiles. If you would have sat down with Paul and said, pick your group of people to go to, Paul. Pick your new career. Welcome to career day with Jesus. Paul would never would have picked what God picked for him. You want me to go to the unclean pagan Gentiles? No way. But Paul does it, and he does it with faithfulness and boldness and courage. You know why? Because he knows my life belongs to Jesus. If my life is centered on and about Jesus, he's not going to care what the other Pharisees say or think of him. He's not gonna get all hung up and caught up on how people respond to him or how people misunderstand. How could you go? By the way, even early Christians struggle with Paul going to the Gentiles, right? And so Paul's like, yeah, but this is what God has called me to do. This is where Jesus is leading me to do. And I want to be faithful to Jesus. I want my life to be about Jesus and his glory. So I'm not concerned with how other people view it, how they respond, how they might criticize or attack. I'm not even worried if they misunderstand me. So the secret to having courage and faith like Paul, to face things like Paul did, and probably not as extreme conditions as Paul, is not to just wake up one day and be like, you know what, today and this week, I wanna be like Paul. It's to follow his example and say, you know what, my life belongs to Jesus. He has forgiven me, he has redeemed me, he has made me his own. And because of that, my eternal life belongs to him. But more than just my eternal life belongs to him, my here and now earthly life belongs to him. And if you make Jesus the center of your life and his glory the center of your life, you don't have to live in fear anymore. That was Paul's attitude. That's why Paul lined up his resume. He's like, it's all rubbish. Don't matter anymore. Why? He goes, because I have Jesus. Because of Jesus, I have eternal life with him. So in the intermediary, (laughs) in the earthly life, if people don't like me, if people are mis misunderstand me, or people are confused, I don't have to walk around always justifying myself, explaining myself, defending myself. I know we do it all the time, but have any, have any of you ever realized how exhausting it can be? That just always, I gotta, I gotta explain myself, I gotta defend myself, all these things. Paul says, well, if you're not the center of your life anymore, and Jesus is, I know it sounds very flippant, but Paul's like, who cares? Who cares what they think of Paul? Paul's one definition of himself is, I am the worst sinner of all time. So there's really not a lot left you can say about him that would hurt his feelings, right? (laughs) If you're like, I'm the worst sinner of all time, he's like, well, you know, you can say all these other things about me, it's not gonna matter. And the whole defense that Paul has is because my life is not my own. It it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to Jesus. Now, why can you trust Jesus the way Paul did? I know the simple answer is, well, we're in church, and the Bible says to, but I want to give you a couple examples here. In verse 21, God, Jesus says to Paul, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So for Paul, that's saying, I want you to leave your home, I want you to go far away to a people that are not like you, that are totally different than you, that reject you, that reject your God because they're Gentile pagans and all this stuff. And why can Jesus say that? It's because Jesus did it first. Jesus left his home. He came down from heaven, far away to a group of people that were unclean, unholy, and had rejected him. It's called humanity, it's you and me. So Jesus does this first. He becomes the one who goes far away from home to a group of people that are unclean and unholy, says, but I'm gonna bring to them good news and a message of salvation and forgiveness.
So Paul is able to hear this word from Jesus go, oh, that's because Jesus did it for me first. And now I can take that message and bring it to the world. The other reason is because Paul was looking to the future. His whole life was oriented on, I'm going to be with Jesus one day. So I got nothing left to fear or worry about in this earthly life. And the reason is because Jesus did it first. In Hebrews chapter 12, the author of Hebrews says this, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus does what he tells Paul to do. He's like, I want you to go, and you're going to suffer. You're going to face persecution. Not everybody's going to like you, but I'm promising you there is a reward at the end. And the reason you can trust Jesus, that he's not lying to you, is because Jesus did it first. He suffered persecution, he suffered all kinds of horrendous things, even death on the cross. And yet the reason he did it is because Paul, in Hebrews says, because he had a joy set before him. And now his reward is that he is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. So the secret to running the race not giving up, having courage like the Apostle Paul is to look to Jesus. That was Paul's secret in all of his ministry. He kept looking to Jesus and being reminded, oh no, Jesus did this first. He suffered for me and in my place. He ran the race perfectly on my behalf because he had joy set before him. You know the joy of Jesus is you and me because that's what he gets in the cross. The joy of the cross for Jesus is redeeming sinners and bringing them home. And his reward is he gets to sit at the right hand of the Father. And so he gets to tell you with confidence and truthfulness, no, 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 I want you as my followers to run the race with endurance, with courage and boldness and faithfulness. The reason is because Jesus ran it first. And we get the same reward that he gets. We get to be in heaven with our heavenly Father. So here's the sermon. The answer is Jesus. How many of you can remember that one? Right? I know I can ask you all kinds of Bible questions and things that confuse you. But you know when we were kids, right, the, the right answer in Sunday school and church was usually, even if you didn't know, you're like, well, we're playing Bible trivia, so Jesus, right? The good news is it, faith is really that simple. The, the answer is Jesus. How did Paul have such amazing courage and faithfulness despite all the things he faced? Jesus. He knew Jesus had redeemed him and forgiven him. He knew Jesus did it first. He knew Jesus was with him. And the same thing can be said for you and me. Jesus has forgiven you and redeemed you. Jesus ran the race first on your behalf. And Jesus is going to give you a reward of eternal life. So therefore, you and I can be like Paul. We can say, I can go far away. I can go do things I'm not sure of. I can go do things that are hard because I have Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are indeed the author and perfecter of our faith, that you ran the race perfectly for us, and that because of you, we have forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. May we follow you not just for eternal life, but for our daily life, Lord. May we go wherever you send us. May we make our lives about you and not about us so that more people may know your love and grace and mercy. In your name we pray, amen.